Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us here in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium for History is Lunch. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. Since our move into the new museums in 2018, we've been able to live stream videos of these programs on the department's Facebook page, which has led people who couldn't attend still experience the presentations. We are continuing that, of course. Uh, we'll stream and archive those videos on Facebook, but we have also added them to the department's YouTube channel to make it easier for people without Facebook accounts to watch those. So if any of you would like to revisit some old favorites or ones you have missed, you have the videos on two platforms now. Tomorrow, from 5 to 7 p.m., join us for another edition of History Happy Hour, where we'll focus on women in Mississippi history as part of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. We'll feature flash tour tours of pertinent exhibits and artifacts in both museums, and live music from Jazz Beautiful, an all-female band featuring singer Pam Confer. Cash bar, free hors d'oeuvres, tomorrow, 5 to 7 here at the museums. Then on Thursday of next week, the Old Capitol Museum will showcase world-renowned Elvis Presley tribute artist Al Jocelyn from 6 to 8 p.m. There are cards over there you can pick up uh, for more information. Tickets are $40 in advance, $50 at the door, and that gets you free eats and an open bar in addition to the concert. The band will feature songs from Presley's 68 comeback tour, uh, so 60s-inspired attire is encouraged, and a prize will be awarded for the best dressed. Finally, I hope that you will join us here next week when Governor Phil Bryant, First Lady Deborah Bryant, and watercolor artist Bill Wilson will discuss their new University Press of Mississippi book, The Mississippi Governor's Mansion, Memories of the People's Home. Today, though, we are delighted to welcome back Clay Williams to present the glorious 8th of January, a date forgotten in history. Clay Williams is co-author of Battle for the Southern Frontier, The Creek War and the War of 1812 with Mike Vaughn. He holds a BA and MA from Mississippi State University, and since 1999, Williams has been employed with MDAH, where he oversees operations for the Eudora Welty House and Garden, Manship House Museum, Old Capitol Museum, Winterville Mounds, Historic Jefferson College, and Grand Village of the Natchez Indians. Williams has published articles in the Journal of Mississippi History and Mississippi History Now, and he and Bunn are writing a volume in the Heritage of Mississippi series on Frontier Mississippi, 1800 to 1840. Help me welcome Clay Williams. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? I have to admit, I told Chris this this morning. I, I came over here yesterday to kind of familiarize myself with the setup because I haven't spoke here before. And as you walk up those two steps, you almost feel like you're going into the gallows. So I don't know. <laughs> so if I start looking around a whole lot, then you can figure out what's going on. Again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, to be the uh, the opening speaker for History is Lunch for 2020, and I thought to myself, Chris is actually a lot smarter than we thought. The idea is to set up a speaker in which everybody afterwards will be so much better. So um, kudos to Chris. Um, I'm here today to talk about, to me, an important date in history, and that's January the 8th. Um, it used to be much more known, uh, well-known nationwide, and now it's kind of faded from history. So I'm going to give a little discussion about that. Um, there are many dates in U.S. history that we just know by heart. You don't even have to put the year after it. July 4th, it's Independence Day. Nothing else needs to be said. December 7th, when you hear December 7th, what do you think? It's Pearl Harbor. You don't need to know 1941. It's our, our personal day of infamy. Nothing else needs to be said. Along the same lines, June 6th. June 6th will forever be D-Day. Um, it, it needs no more uh, introduction. I was trying to think of a date a little bit more recent, and the best thing I could come up with was 9-11. Uh, September 11th now means something to us. It's hard to believe we're almost approaching 20 years when that event took place. It seems like yesterday, and in a way, it seems like it's a long time ago. So again, these dates say all they need to say, um, and because of that, I think January 8th says all it needs to say, too. I have lured you here to talk about the War of 1812, but in reality, I'm going to talk for an hour and a half on Elvis Presley and all his greatness. Now, uh, today, of course, is the king's birthday, and as Chris says, uh, a week from tomorrow, the old capital will have a great program, a, a great Elvis tribute artist, and I would encourage everybody to go see that. But in reality, I'm here today to talk about the Battle of New Orleans, uh, the concluding climatic battle of the War of 1812 and how important this used to mean to this country, and yet over the past 205 years, it's now faded from history. 
So what I plan to do today is give a kind of an overview, give, put this all in a little context, and tell you where we are today. Uh, first, I've got to set a little background here. Uh, we're talking about a, an area of the country that at one point in time was known as the Old Southwest. Not talking about Oklahoma or Texas here. We're talking about the states of Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, Mississippi and Alabama didn't exist at that point. It was the Mississippi Territory. At this point, I always have to make my joke about what a college football powerhouse that would have become had they not split it up. <laughs> and as Chris mentioned, I did go to Mississippi State, but as of yet, I've not been named head coach for next year. We will wait and see. Job is still open. Job is still open. Um, the important thing I want to bring up here is Florida. Uh, at this point in time, Florida is not the Florida we're all familiar with. Florida is a Spanish possession. This is a foreign power at our southern border, and that's going to play a huge role in what else I'm supposed to say. But at around the turn of the century, around the 1800s, is when, of course, we're beginning a lot of Western migration. People are headed westward in search of new opportunities and new, uh, a new chance at life. And at this point in time, the predominant population of the region is Native Americans. Here in Mississippi, we're more familiar with the Choctaws and the Chickasaws, but further eastward was the Creek, uh, the Creek Nation. They're kind of uh, located along what is today the border of Alabama and Georgia, and they're kind of on the front lines for this major immigration pull. And the Creek Nation has got a lot of decisions they're trying to make. Do they want to... Uh, acclimate to a, a new uh, white man way of life and, and put down the bow and take up the plow, or they want to resist that and, and kind of begin, uh, you, know, you know, hold on to their traditional way of life. Um, at the same time, at this time period, of course, you've got uh, the international situation, which in Europe has been war. A little guy by the name of Napoleon has been causing lots of problems in Europe, and England has been wrapped up in war with, uh, with, with Napoleon in France. And that, of course, is going to involve the United States, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but again, we have this uneasy relationship with the Creek Nation uh, and the encroaching Americans. The individual you see here is Tecumseh. He is kind of the spark that lights the fire. He is a Shawnee Indian, and along with his brother, known as the Prophet, he uh, travels south uh, to visit the Native American nations to kind of build up support for a Native American confederacy to basically get the Native American tribes from the Great Lakes all the way to the Gulf Coast to kind of say, enough is enough. We're not going to sign any more treaties. We're not going to give up any more land. Uh, we're going to say enough is enough. Uh, the Chickasaws and the Choctaws kind of run him off. They're scared he's basically preaching war. But the Creeks, especially those who are very adamant on holding on to their way of life, buy into Tecumseh's message. And that's going to lead into a Creek civil war. That's how it starts. The Creek nation begins warring amongst themselves. It will eventually, like most conflicts, spread and involve white settlers in the United States. So we're going to eventually have a bloody Creek War. At the same time, we've got this European situation. Again, Florida, located at the southern border, is Spanish. Spain, at this point in time, is allied with England. And so there have been rumors of Spanish and British agents kind of inciting the Native Americans to, to cause havoc. And so what's going to eventually happen, we're going to, we're going to, the, the, the Creek forces are going to be defeated, and that's going to eventually lead to the British entering the war. Um, August 30th of uh, 1813 is known as the Battle of Fort Mims. Uh, Fort Mims was a stockade built about 20 miles north of Mobile, and it was attacked by a hostile uh, Creek force known as Red Sticks. They were called Red Sticks because their club was painted red obviously enough. And so when the battle is done, over 300 or nearly 300 men, women, soldiers, children are killed. It's an horrific battle. Uh, it gets played up in the press as the Fort Mims massacre, and that leads to uh, basically uh, soldiers from Georgia, Tennessee, and the Mississippi Territory, as, as well as regular U.S. troops converging on Creek Territory to put down this rebellion. And this is happening at the exact same time the U.S. is at war with England. If you look back to, or you think back to your old high school history books, of course, it was mainly the impressment of U.S. sailors uh, by the British Navy that kind of got us into the war. It was such a, uh, an affront to U.S. sovereignty. So the U.S. government is dealing with fighting the British overseas and up in Canada and the Great, uh, in the Great Lakes. But at the same time, we now have conflict further south. Um, if anybody knows anything about the Creek War, it's mainly Andrew Jackson and his efforts. Uh, Andrew Jackson first came onto the scene when he led some soldiers down to Natchez 
in early 1813, and they were going to be sent to New Orleans to help to defend the city because as early as 1812 and 1813, there was a fear of New Orleans being a vulnerable place for the British to attack. And so Jackson gets down to Natchez, but there's some confusion of orders and a man by the name of James Wilkinson, who I could talk for three days on James Wilkinson, um, he ends up dismissing that force and letting them go. Jackson decides, I can't leave these men hundreds of miles away from home, so he leads them back up the Natchez Trace, and that's where he gets his name Old Hickory because he's tough as an old hickory tree, and so that's where that name Old Hickory comes from. But Fort Mims happens in, uh, in, in uh, 1813, and he leads his forces southward from Fayetteville, Tennessee, and wins a number of battles and eventually uh, culminating in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which happens in March of 1814. And this is the culminating batter that kind of uh, that kind of ends the Creek War. Uh, and so at that point, Jackson has become kind of a national hero, but more is yet to come. Um, and at this point is when the British begin eyeing the Gulf Coast. Again, most of the War of 1812 has been around Canada and the Great Lakes, but they always believed that the Gulf Coast was the soft underbelly, easily vulnerable to any attack. What the British hoped to do was to utilize those Creek warriors as their main fighting force. They would land some soldiers and some consultants and whatnot, train the Native Americans, the Creeks, and mainly use them as a fighting force. The problem is they show up too late. Horseshoe Bend is in March of 1814. The British first show up around Apalachicola, in May of 1814. And when they arrive down there, they only find several refugees, some of the, the last remaining Creek warriors. So it's too late. One of the what ifs, history uh, people love to talk about what if, or what if the British had landed six months earlier and been able to arm and better instruct and train the, the Creeks. Who knows how that would have happened. But uh, on an international scale, it's important to know by this point in time, Napoleon makes a kind of a big mistake and decides to visit Russia in the, in the winter, and that doesn't work out real well. And that eventually leads to him in 1813 abdicating the throne. Never underestimate when you're thinking about the War of 1812, England's priority and their emphasis and focus is not on these former colonies. It's on France and it's on securing themselves in Europe. But once Napoleon is defeated, they can now begin focusing pure energies and their focus on their, the upstart colonies who they were, you know, they, they hated who got away back in the 1700s. And so in uh, the fall of 1814, some of these soldiers who actually had fought uh, Napoleon in Europe have now been transferred over here, and many of them take part in the invasion along the Chesapeake. As we all know, in August of 1814, Washington, D.C. is captured, it's burned, it's a, it's a devastating blow to this country, whether it's uh, morale-wise or whatnot. You never want to lose your capital in war. Of course, a month later, they also attack Baltimore. And on a positive note for this country, that leads us, of course, to the Star-Spangled Banner. And as we all know, the flag was still there after the bombardment at Fort Henry. So again, the point of all this is Great Britain can now focus their energies and their considerable might against the U.S., uh, the soldiers that will eventually be aimed at New Orleans aren't the, the leftovers. This is the pride of, of, of England. This is, this, is the, this is the most powerful force in the world at this time. Um, as I mentioned, the British first land around Apalachicola, Florida in May of 1814. That's when they arrive and find out there's not as many Creek warriors as they can use as possible. So right off the bat, the, the British Gulf Coast ideas and plans and schemes are kind of going downhill. So at that point, he begins, uh, the British high command begins to think about other ways to get towards New Orleans. And at that point, Mobile becomes an important part of uh, their plans. Who here can tell me where Fort Boyer is located? Who here can tell me where Fort Morgan is located? Well, Fort Morgan, of course, is where Admiral Farragut said, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead during the Civil War. Fort Morgan was built on the site of Fort Boyer, which guards Mobile Point. That was a little fortification that Andrew Jackson had, helped, had built guarding Mobile Bay. And so in September of 1814, these British forces attack Fort Boyer, and they lose. British warships try to bombard the fort. The British land some men on the, on the ground to try to kind of besiege it, and they fail. So here we go. The British have now kind of failed to get a big fighting force. They failed to capture Mobile to make that their base of operations. And so now their next idea is their friends, the Spanish in Pensacola. Uh, Spain at this point, though, uh, is not the Spain of the 1500s. They are now an a empire on decline. 
Uh, Spain had basically been using Florida mainly as a buffer zone to their more popular and their more uh, valuable possessions in South America. But the British decide to steam into Pensacola Bay, their allies, and say, we're going to use this as a jumping off part. Um, the Spanish governor is in a bad place. He really doesn't want any part of this conflict whatsoever. He's just wanting to keep his head down and have things go as they have been, but that's not going to be the case. And this is where a little bit of Andrew Jackson's leadership comes into play. Pensacola is Spanish Florida. We are not at war with Spain. And so, but, but Andrew Jackson wants to break up this little party, and he basically begins sending messages to Secretary of State James Monroe and President James Madison saying, I need permission to move towards Pensacola. Well, the President and Secretary of State are not wanting to grant that permission, but Jackson writes last time, I am acting without orders, and I'm going to Pensacola. In November of 1814, he does exactly that. Uh, there's a small little battle there. To call it a battle is more of a that's, a, that's a, that's not the right word, a skirmish. A couple of shots are fired. The Spanish governor surrenders just as quickly as he possibly can because he does not want a full-scale battle here. The British have to evacuate. Um, they blow up one of the forts there guarding the bay, Fort Barrancas, and basically they have to, they have to leave. So Jackson's uh, offensive-minded spirit prevented the British from now using Pensacola as a jumping-off part for New Orleans. So, so far, so good. Jackson, who's now a, in charge of the, the 7th U.S. military district in the South, has done a good job of defending the Gulf South. But there are bigger problems and bigger threats ahead. So the British have failed at Mobile. They have now failed at uh, Pensacola. So there's only thing, one, you know, one thing left to do is now you know, aim their juggernaut towards New Orleans. Uh, taking a step back here, we can never underestimate the importance of the town of New Orleans. Um, that's why Thomas Jefferson spent what he did on it to get it during the Louisiana Purchase. If you think about it, any kind of commerce, anything at all that's in the western part of this country is going to be floated down rivers through New Orleans out to markets across the world. If you control New Orleans, you control everything. And so the importance of this city was, was I mean, I, I can't overestimate its importance. But New Orleans is also, like it is today, a very multicultural city. French, Spanish, Creoles, a little bit of everybody, as we all know, lives in New Orleans. And so there was lots of concerns about will the citizenry there rally around the flag, so to speak, to defend itself against Great Britain, or were they just kind of you know, happy to bring in somebody else? Uh, Jackson has some major concerns about New Orleans as well. There are many avenues of access to get to the city. You can come up through the river from the Gulf. Uh, perhaps they could land troops and go to Baton Rouge and come down the river. There's Lake Bourne and Lake Pontchartrain that give you access to the city. So Jackson has got to set up forts and little camps and scouts and spies to try to figure out which way the British will come through. Well, in this case, the British are going to do well. In fact, they're going to do well in December of 1814 with a naval battle. Who ever knew there was a War of 1812 naval battle fought off the Gulf Coast? Other than you, Jim Pitts. Okay. Yes, there's a few people here. Um, the Battle of Lake Bourne takes place December, I believe, 14th of 1814. Jackson had a, a Navy, uh, I think about four or five ships there, not only uh, providing security for the lake, but to also serve as the eyes and ears of his armies. The British attack, and they defeat those warships and capture them. So finally, the great, you know, England kind of has a victory in this campaign, and at this point, Jackson loses some of his eyes. You know, there's no radar, there's no telephones, there's, you know, you have to, you know, look out to your, uh, for your enemy the old fashioned way. And so at this point, as I back up, the British come up with a plan on how they're going to land close to New Orleans. They, and this is an unbelievable, just think about this. The big warships can't go into Lake Bourne. They've got to unload soldiers under smaller boats. So they first row their soldiers on boats, long skiffs, 30 miles to what is known as Pea Island, which is at the bottom of the Pearl River into the Gulf. They use that as an initial staging area, and then they row 40 miles from there to what is known as a Spanish fisherman's village located where Bayou Bienvenu empties out into Lake Bourne. So what a massive amount of rowing that must have been. When his men begin, the British forces begin landing at that fisherman's village on the morning of December 23rd, they quickly capture who Jackson had posted there to, to put the word out. So at this point in time, Jackson has no idea that the most powerful army in the world has landed at his doorstep. They proceed to continue to move inward towards the Villery Plantation, which you can see at the bottom of the map, and I guess I can use this handy dandy pointer. Um, that's about 10, 12 miles from the heart of New Orleans. 
They capture the plantation, capture the scouts again that Jackson have there. Um, and again, at this point, Jackson still doesn't know the British are here. Thankfully, one of those men they captured escapes and runs just as quick as he possibly can to Jackson, who's based in New Orleans. And we have now gotten to the moment of truth at the Battle of New Orleans. Again, the most powerful army in the world has landed and got right underneath Jackson's nose at New Orleans. The city is in dire danger. Jackson is faced with one of those critical decisions that all military commanders have. He has two choices. Number one, uh-oh, the gig is up. They've caught me unaware. My troops are scattered all over the place. I don't have a force to fight him. Uh, I might as well live to fight another day. I retreat, give up New Orleans, and, and live to fight another day. That would have been a, a sound military decision, and I'm not sure anybody could argue that. But if you know anything about Andrew Jackson, that ain't Andrew Jackson. Um, when he gets word that the British have landed on his soil, he exclaims in complete Jacksonian fashion, By the eternal, they shall not sleep on our soil. And he gathers his men as quickly as he can. And even though I'm here today to talk about the importance of January the 8th, December 23rd is when New Orleans is saved. Jackson gathers the men he has at his disposal and launches a night attack on the British encampment there at the Villarie Plantation. Night attacks are rare things for obvious reasons. You don't know friend or foe. It's, it's, it's chaotic. There's no way to control troops, but Jackson feels like he has no choice. I need to re-seize the initiative here and launch an attack against the British, and that's what he does on the 23rd. It's about a two-hour affair. It's as chaotic as you can imagine. Uh, the American forces there do well at first, push the British back. But again, this is a well-disciplined, trained army. They're not going to get complete defe completely defeated. They end up holding their line, and Jackson has to pull back. So from a tactical point of view, this battle on the 23rd is a draw. No one really wins or loses this battle. But Jackson has seized the initiative, and more importantly, kept the British from continuing the initiative. The British probably thought they would you know, get up the next morning on the 24th and march leisurely into town and capture the city. There's no resistance ahead of them. Uh-oh, they've had their nose bloodied. They're going to wait and wait for more of their soldiers to land on, 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 you know, land and get settled, which gives Jackson enough time. I don't know if you can see this, but right here is known as the Rodriguez Canal. That is where Jackson is going to build his defensive position, known as Line Jackson. It's basically a canal that they're going to dig out to make almost like a deep moat. They're going to build a rampart full of mud and man it with artillery and Kentucky and Tennessee riflemen and basically build a pretty much indefensible position. That line did not exist as of December the 23rd. It was only Jackson's uh, offensive uh, thought processes and, 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 and daring. Let's be honest, that's, that's a risk. He could have attacked on the 23rd and got his you-know-what whipped, and who knows what happens. So that's kind of the way it is as of December 23rd. At this point in time, the gentleman here named General Edward Packenham is going to be the final British general in charge. It took him a while to get here. He's been given command of this force. Uh, he is the brother-in-law of the Duke of Wellington. The Duke of Wellington is the most famous military general in Europe. It's his brother-in-law. So he's not some you know, you know, lowly colonel they've sent over here to command it. They've sent Pack uh, 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 Wellington's brother-in-law. In fact, Wellington was offered command over here after the uh, Napoleonic Wars. He declined it. I think the Duke of Wellington knew that he was going to have no you know, fame or glory over here. He, he, he sent his brother-in-law instead. But if I pull back a little bit, Packenham, once he arrives on the 24th, sees the military situation, and he is unhappy as you can possibly be. Yes, the British force have gotten within 10 miles of the city, but let's look at it. They are trapped now on this little bit of land between a river... Anybody pretty familiar with that river? That's a pretty tough river to get across. And swamps. The only way to get to New Orleans is to walk through or to march through this big open area here in which a big impenetrable position has been placed in front of them. Armies in the 19th century like to march. They like to maneuver. They like to conduct flank attacks. They like to do all these great things. They really don't like to charge headlong into artillery and, and, and rifle fire. And so Packenham is... He probably feels right from the back, I'm in a no-win situation here. Jean Lafitte is another character I want to bring out. He's a pirate. He's a Baratarian pirate who's been smuggling off the Gulf Coast. Um, he's just an example of the diverse fighting force that Jackson is going to gather to defend this city. 
Lafitte actually offered his services to Jackson saying, I've got men who can fire weapons. I've got ammunition. I've got gunpowder. Jackson at first wanted nothing to do with him. He's, he referred to Lafitte and his band as hellish banditti. But again, once Jackson knew, wait a minute, he's got men who can fire guns. He's got ammunition. Come on down. I'd love to have you here. So Lafitte is just one of this group of soldiers that Jackson's going to gather. He's got Tennessee and Kentucky militiamen, and whatever is in your mind about the frontier soldier of that time period, that's about what we're talking about. He does have some uh, regular U.S. soldiers there. Uh, he has New Orleans militia. He has Choctaw Indians on his line. He has free men of color who have been armed and defending his line. Uh, he's got a little bit of everything but the kitchen sink. It is, a, I mean, if there's ever a, an American fighting force that's been gathered to defend a city, this is it. But he's up against the most powerful army in the world, and he really doesn't know what he's got. So, but he's got enough sense to build this pretty impregnable defensive position and see what happens. Well, um, Packenham's now got some choices to make himself. On the 28th, uh, a couple of days later, he decides to kind of launch a, an attack on the line. Um, it's kind of a two-waved attack. Some men attack close to the river. Some men attack close to the swamp, and they get beaten back pretty easily. But reconnaissance in force is one of the greatest military propaganda languages of all time. After the battle, no commander wants to write, yes, my men attacked and we failed. Nobody wants to say that. So he says, we launched a reconnaissance in force. In other words, we were just testing the lines. We really weren't attacking. We are just checking it out. So if you ever see any generals and military people refer to their uh, movements as a reconnaissance in force, you might want to question exactly what may have happened there. But it fails tremendously, so Packenham is again wondering, what am I going to do? His next idea is, you know what? I'm going to bring all that artillery off my warships. I'm going to manhandle it through the, through the lakes, through the swamps, and I'm just going to blow line Jackson to smithereens. And that's what happens on January the 1st, New Year's Day of 1815. Guess what? It's a total failure. Um, the, the cannonballs, it, it, he doesn't do any damage mainly to Jackson's line. A lot of the cannonballs end up in the mud. I mean, they don't do anything. Jackson's artillery actually does more damage to the British artillery than the British artillery did to the, um, to the, uh, the American artillery. So, you know, here we are. It's now first week in January. These soldiers have now been on land for a week. It's December. It's January. It's cold. It's wet. It's miserable. Packenham's like, what am I? He's got soldiers getting sick. Um, he's trapped between a river and a swamp. What's he going to do? He's got two choices. Choice one is pull out. And gosh knows you can't do that. And so he basically comes up with a plan to launch a full scale attack on January the 8th. What is not known to the history books is his plan is actually pretty darn good, but like a lot of military plans, it doesn't go off like it was supposed to. The weakness of Jackson's uh, defensive line was not the one you see there predominantly. It's over here on the west bank. He's got some soldiers and some cannon located over here to kind of defend the west bank in case the British go over there, but also to provide some infilid fire on the, uh, the British had they attacked. So Pakenham's plan is good. He's going to launch a bunch of men in some boats across the river, land down here, capture this position, turn those guns against the American line, and then launch his attack. It's got a good chance of succeeding. Most military historians have looked at that and said, well, that makes sense. He's probably at bare minimum going to force Jackson to pull back. But what happens is like, you know, the best laid plans or what is, what is the phrase? The best laid plans are laid to waste or something. Somebody help. Thank you. Um, it takes forever for the boats to get across the river. The Mississippi River's got a pretty good current, <laughs> in case you didn't know that. And so they didn't have a little motorboat to get over there. They were having to row across it. And so they were hoping to just kind of move right across the river. Well, the current took them way down here. And so by the time they actually get landed across the river, it's already daylight on January the 8th, which was the time of the attack. Now, what I have never been able to figure out that no history book has ever really explained to me is why Packenham just did not delay his main attack until his British forces got across the river and did what they needed to do on the West Bank. He launches the attack anyway on dawn on January, tw uh, January 8th. And as you can imagine, it's a disaster. Um, it's a big open field. The, the Americans have eight batteries of artillery it's an impregnable position, and these British soldiers march in you know, typical Napoleonic tactics. They're wearing bright red uniforms. I mean, you, you can't miss it if you tried. And they launch an attack across there, and they get beat up pretty badly. One of the most 
kind of disheartening things to think about is part of the plan was some of the initial soldiers in the British attack were supposed to carry ladders and fascines. Fascines are these big kind of bundles of wood that you would put in the ditch to help you use to kind of cross over and then you place a ladder to climb up the rampart. Well, when the time for the attack takes place, the regiment who has that responsibility has not yet gathered the fascines and the ladders. They're behind them. So what a total disaster to start off with. One of the... Uh, British generals who ends up getting killed in this battle, legend has it one of his last words were, if I ever got a chance to get a hold of that colonel, I was going to hang him from the nearest tree. Um, that was a pretty uh, inept decision. So the battle takes place. It's a pretty 25, 30 minute affair and about 2,000 British soldiers are killed and wounded. The story of, of course, is after the battle, you could walk on the ground and never step on the ground. You could just step on the, the wounded and dying soldiers that are lost. They are just beat up. Jackson loses 20 men. I mean, you want to talk about looking at battlefield casualties and who won, this is pretty obvious. Ironically enough, by the time that battle ends and those British forces have poured back, the British forces across the river have captured the West Bank. Jackson really did not do a good job of securing this position. They capture the West Bank. Those British soldiers are literally in the process of trying to get those guns turned around when he gets word from the British on the other side of the river, pull back. It's been a failure. Pull back. So again, uh, what, a, what an absolute crazy nightmare of a battle. Um, but January 8th, again, uh, probably one of the greatest military victories this country's ever had. When you think of military history, you think of World War I and World War II and the Civil War. But you want to talk about an American victory that is without a doubt and one that really has the bang for its butt, it's the Battle of New Orleans. It's been plenty of artwork done over over the years. Uh, you can see some of the artwork here. Uh, again, January 8th is the culmination of the campaign. There you can see the soldiers going across the river. Military history and historians and, and buffs just love reading about bravery in battle. You know, we, know, we talked about D-Day. I can only imagine the amount of bravery it took to, to come off of those boats and storm Normandy. <clears throat> you can talk about the Union soldiers at Fredericksburg, or the Confederate soldiers at uh, Franklin or Gettysburg. But you want to talk about bravery is, 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 is to suit yourself up in a red outfit and march in military precision order against Chalmette at the line Jackson. That's bravery at the, the highest cost, I believe. Well, after the battle is over, um, the British still have some other ideas. They actually eventually launch some ships up the Mississippi River to try to bombard some of the forts south of the city, thinking, hey, if we can get past Fort St. Philip, we'll just continue to move our boats up the river and capture the city. It fails. They don't bombard the fort enough. The fort holds. So eventually, by the end of January, the British remove themselves from the beaches, so to speak, and pull out of Louisiana and New Orleans. Ironically enough, they don't know the war is over, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. They continue with their military campaign, and in February of 1815, they attack Fort Boyer again, and this time capture it. They uh, put more men and more material uh, in place at Fort Boyer and capture it. And right when they're about to move into Mobile itself is when word of the Treaty of Ghent has come across, knowing that hostilities have ended. So that's going to basically take care of New Orleans. A couple of myths I want to go through here. One of the myths of the war is that New Orleans was saved by the brave Tennessee and Kentucky militiamen with their expert rifle shots and so forth. They manned the line, and they are the ones who decimated the British Army. No. Not that they weren't a huge part of it. It's cannon fire and artillery that really decimated the British Army. So I don't want to take away from any Kentucky and Tennessee frontiersmen and any ancestors anybody has in this room, but never underestimate the importance of big guns. Okay, They get the job done. The most important myth that I hope, if I do anything today, I shatter beyond a doubt. As we know, the Treaty of Ghent, ending the War of 1812, was signed December 24th of 1814. That's two weeks from the Battle of New Orleans. The treaty basically set up status quo Annabella, meaning, hey, everything that was before the war, we're going to go right back to it. So any land that was captured, any cities were captured, well, it's going to revert to back where it was before the war. So a lot of historians, a lot of people want to say, New Orleans didn't matter. The war was already over. A treaty had been signed. Well, two things, I think, make that malarkey. Number one, the treaty might have been signed by dignitaries in Europe, but it hasn't been officially signed off of by the host governments in London and Washington, D.C. They couldn't just email the document and get it signed the next day. It took quite a long time. So that is the first one, the most obvious one. But to me, the second one is, regardless, let's say... 
Washington and, 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 and London authorities had officially signed off the treaty prior to January the 8th. Let's say the British win the battle, Jackson is forced to retreat from New Orleans, and the British capture New Orleans. There's nobody in this room or anywhere who can convince me that England will say, never mind, take this city, this very important city, and take it back. Never mind. I just, Jim's got a question. I'll come back to you in a minute, Jim. Um, I, I just, you cannot convince me that they would have given that up. England had a lot of doubts about the Louisiana Purchase in the first place. They really thought there was some things that weren't correct and legal in that affair. Plus, they just weren't going to give that city up. I don't know if that was going to lead to another battle, or another confrontation. My guess is what would have happened is this country would have had to pay a lot of money to get it back. And at this point in time, the treasury is broke because we've just fought a war. So if you ever read about New Orleans as unimportant, it happened after the battle, it doesn't mean anything, or after the war was ended, that's, that's baloney. And I'm going to say something else in just a few minutes to why I also think the battle is important. How many people have been to New Orleans? Everybody's been to New Orleans. How many people have been to the Chalmette battlefield? Okay, good for y'all. Shame on the rest of y'all. <laughs> shame, shame. The Chalmette battlefield is about, I don't know, 10 miles from the heart of New Orleans. It's not far. Next time you go to New Orleans... Drive up the road. It's a small military park. What you see there now is what's left of Line Jackson. Obviously, that rampart would have been a lot bigger. This ditch would have been a lot deeper. And you can basically see, as you look towards where the British advanced, uh, what a suicide mission that really was to attach across those fields. That is, too, yeah, what's left of it. <laughs> um, uh, of course, one of my favorite places is always Jackson Square. I have probably taken this photograph myself 3,000 times because every time I go there, I have to take a picture of the, of the statue of Jackson and the, the cathedral in the background. Andrew Jackson, and, and this could be a talk for another day, is an intriguing figure to say the least. Um, uh, when he first arrived in New Orleans in December of 1814, he put the city under martial law. He did not rescind martial law until late February, March of 1815 when they finally got word that all the treaty was done. City and government leaders weren't really enamored with Andrew Jackson. Um, they were obviously, a lot of them were concerned with the bottom line and that's money. There were a lot of concerns that if Jackson had to retreat and give up the city, he was going to burn it to the ground because he was not going to have England get away with anything. Um, after the battle was done, you know, the, the, the council and the legislature issue all these resolutions thanking all the brave men and soldiers all the way from the, the lowly colonel to the highest you know, person, thanking them for their defense of New Orleans. They left off one name, Andrew Jackson. So interesting point there. Um, national holidays. Before 1815, this country had two national holidays we celebrated, July 4th and February 22nd. What's February 22nd? Washington's birthday. After this battle takes place, the very next year, this country celebrates January the 8th as a national holiday. They didn't celebrate Yorktown. We didn't celebrate Saratoga. We celebrated January the 8th. We made that a national holiday. That's how important it was to this country and its nationalism morale. Unfortunately, just like everything else, it becomes a casualty of the Civil War. Um, sectionalism prevails and a lot of people in the country aren't interested in celebrating a battle in a, in a now slave state, a part of the former confederacy. And so it just goes away at that point in time. Eventually, as we all know, England becomes one of our greatest allies. We fight with them in World War I and World War II. And so January 8th and its kind of its significance has, has just gone away. Um, I'm up this morning. I'm, I'm getting ready for work. I'm getting dressed. I turn on the TV and I'm wondering, is anybody going to mention January the 8th? They do, but what do they talk about? Elvis. It's Elvis's birthday. And I'm a huge Elvis fan. I'm, you know, nothing against Elvis, but it's a shame that, you know, I don't get a paper, but if anybody goes home and they still get a clarion ledger, see if on page 12 is there a little snippet about the Battle of New Orleans. My guess it's not. When, when, when Pearl Harbor comes around, there's usually something about it. When D-Day comes around, there's usually something about it. Gettysburg, things of that nature. January the 8th comes and goes, and we never think about it anymore. One of my last points here deals with these two wars. The, the Revolutionary War, of course, we, we gain our independence. We become, an, you know, we become a country. We, we, we rid ourselves of British rule, and it, you know, it is what it is. But it's also important to know that after the, the Revolutionary War, we go through some difficult time periods. The Articles of Confederation, they kind of fail. We have to eventually write a constitution. It really takes us a while to become a nation. And it's my opinion that the War of 1812, even though it is filled with lots of uh, military defeats as well, but the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans really makes us a nation. It kind of solidifies us. Hey, we can now prove to the rest of the world that we can stand on our own. 
We defeated the country that defeated Napoleon. I don't know what else you can say beyond that. At this point, I'm going to bring up a little nostalgia here. Um, not many people know anything about New Orleans, but if you know anything, you know about Johnny Horton, who was a folk singer who would sing about all types of things. And at one point, I told Chris I was going to sing this song and do a little song and dance, but he convinced me that might not be a good idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to play a video of this. It's like a two and a half uh, little minute video of the Battle of New Orleans by Johnny Horton. So I hope Eric can help me out here and can get this done. Don't leave me hanging, Eric. Here we go. Please feel free to sing along. In 1814, we took a little trip Along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi We took a little bacon and we took a little beans And we caught the bloody British in a town in New Orleans We fired our guns and the British kept for coming There wasn't as many as there was a while ago now, While he's, he why he's dressed like an extra John Wayne movie, I don't down know Down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico we look down a river and we see the British come And there must have been a hundred of them beating on the drum We stepped so high and they made the bugles ring We stood beside our cotton bales and didn't say a thing We fired our guns and the British kept a-coming There wasn't as many as there was a while ago We fired once more and they began to run it On down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico Old Hickory said we could take them by surprise If we didn't fire muskets till we looked them in the eye We held our fire till we see the faces well Then we opened up our squirrel guns and really gave them well We fired our guns and the British kept them coming There wasn't as many as there was a while ago We fired once more and they began to run it Went Down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico Everybody must be able to sing this before they leave today Yeah, they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles And they ran through the bushes where the rabbit couldn't go. They ran so fast that the hounds couldn't catch them. On down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. We fired our cannon till the barrel melted down. So we grabbed an alligator and we fought another round. We filled his head with cannonballs and powdered his behind. And when we touched the powder off, the gator lost his mind. We fired our guns and the British kept a coming. There wasn't as many as there was a while ago. We fired once more and they began to run it on down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles and they ran through the bushes where a rabbit couldn't go. They ran so fast that the hounds couldn't catch them on down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Marty Robbins. I wouldn't mind listening to Marty Robbins. I don't know how. I don't know if Eric can get me back to the normal show. There we go. Um, I hope y'all all be humming that for the rest of the day. So, what does all this mean in summary? Again, the Battle of New Orleans is one of those huge things that helps us finally secure the Gulf South from European threats. Since the very beginning of when Europeans came to this country, they've been along the Gulf Coast. The Spanish, the French. Uh, the British, everybody. Well, New Orleans, and eventually we're going to sign a treaty in 1819. We're finally going to secure the Gulf Coast for all time, secure our southern border. It's going to bring Andrew Jackson to prominence. Of course, he's going to take this and go to two terms as president of the United States. And, you know, his impact, whether it's Native American removal or you know, pushing for democratic, more democracy in government, uh, love him or hate him, his impact is, is unquestionable. I like to think as you look about U.S. history, there are several eras that we talk about. The, the colonial era, the Civil War, Reconstruction, New Deal, Depression, Civil Rights era. There's only one named after a man. That's the Jacksonian era, the age of Jackson. So again, love him, hate him, whatever. His impact, I mean, here we are in a city today named after him. Uh, he's pretty important. And as I said earlier, the U.S. finally becomes a nation. We finally have enough to say we, we can stand on our own and we're not just a bunch of upstart colonies waiting for some European power to take us over again. Um, I will bring up this book written by one of the premier historians of the Southeast. <laughs> and Clay Williams, I guess I should say. 
Um, Haley's managed to grab a few of the books. She's dusted them off from the back, some back closet somewhere. So if you are interested, she's got a few. But I also want to bring up, and I can't believe I'm touting another story, and why would I ever want to do that? But um, William C. Davis has written a, a new book on the Battle of New Orleans. Many of y'all are probably familiar with William C. Davis. He has written about everything. Um, I just finished this book in mid-November, and that's when I, I, I contacted Chris, and I said, you know what? As we approached January 8th, I saw January 8th was the first Wednesday of the year. I said, my goodness, this is, this is a book. Uh, I'd love to do this presentation. So if you like anything of what I said and really want to get into detail, He's now written the definitive book on the Battle of New Orleans, so I'd recommend it. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you all for listening to me today, and I hope when you think about January 8th next year, you think a little bit about New Orleans and all of that. Again, appreciate you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Time for questions. If you'll raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. Do I have to take these questions, or can I choose? No, this is just a comment, Clay. There was actually language written into the Treaty of Ghent by the British that would give them possession of any lands they had taken by the time of the treaty. Right. Which meant if they had taken New Orleans, they wouldn't have given it back. And yeah. you're right about the, them believing about the uh, Louisiana Purchase wasn't really... Wasn't kosher. real. Yeah. Well, the negotiations in Europe were all over the place. And, and again, if you're doing a treaty negotiation, if your side is winning, you feel like you can ask for what you want. But the war kind of went back and forth. And so one, you know, one side would say, hey, you better give us all this. And then the tide would turn in the war and go the other way. So uh, that's a good point, Jim. Thanks. I have an ancestor who was in the Battle of New Orleans. He was from Tennessee. And uh, the legend and the family doesn't say anything about fighting or anything, except uh, there was a, a recruiting effort around Nashville, which is also the ancestral home of uh, Andrew Jackson, just outside there. And uh, a group of Tennesseans went down there, and I noticed in there you referred to those, and uh, whether they played a pivotal role, it's... Uh, I accept what you said about them, and that, that's not the point. Well, and again, I don't want to sound like no. I'm downplaying their role. Well, but well just... no, any, anyway, uh, it was not clear to me. The uh, family legend says this guy took his fiddle with him. He had a fiddle, and that he there was a victory celebration, and that he played the fiddle uh, as... Uh, I have no more details, but my question is, uh, there were Tennesseans down there, mm -hmm. And my question is, when did they arrive? And uh, it's sort of implied that Jackson himself around Nashville recruited these people and brought them down, but that's not clear. And it sounds to me that that, that uh, somebody else did that part. At this point in time, Jackson is, is in control of the, the Southern Military District down there, and so he's in Mobile. But once he knows the British are coming, he begins contacting governors and so forth and acquiring troops. So yes... He didn't lead those troops to New Orleans. Uh, John Coffey, who was one of his uh, major lieutenants, is the one who led the Tennesseans. And when Jackson gets down there on December 1st, Coffey and his Tennesseans are some of the first ones who are there. Let's talk about Mississippians that went down. Um, okay. Colonel Hines took 1,000 uh, militia. Yep. And uh, anybody else that you can think of that would be significant in the Battle of New Orleans from Mississippi? I will say two things. Thomas Hines, yeah, he leads cavalrymen, a bunch of uh, elite cavalrymen from Natchez. They take part in, they took part in that December 23rd attack. Uh, they, were, um, they were behind the lines at the January 8th battle. One of the more intriguing stories about Mississippians that I've, I've learned a few places, a man by the name of George Poindexter. George Poindex is an early leader in this state, eventually becomes uh, governor. He's also, I think, our first representative. Um, he was an aide down there on one of the, you know, serving as an aide de camp at one of the, the commanders down there. Later on, uh, during uh, a lot of more in the Mississippi territorial period, there became a lot of discussions on how brave George Poindexter was at the Battle of New Orleans. And uh, Poindexter, a, a newspaper man by the name of Andrew Marshall, get into a, as I drop a book, get into a fight in Washington, Mississippi, because Marshawk probably alluded to that Poindexter was a coward. And so no, no man's going to let that happen. So he chases Marshawk with a brick through the streets of Washington. So that's probably not what you're looking for, but that's one of the most intriguing stories of a Mississippian. <laughs> he's, he's accused of cowardice, and he has to defend his honor with a brick. I don't know what more Mississippi story I can come up with besides that. <laughs> But the, the, the Heinz's troopers are the one, the more, uh, some of the more well-known soldiers down there. 
There's always been some question about the number of cannon and the number of people on both sides. The cannon situation probably had something to do with Lafitte. Do you have any ideas? I knew there were a, a total of um, like eight batteries. Now, each battery is not just one gun. There may be two or three. So you've got to think there's at least probably 16 guns going across those lines. Um, Yes, Lafitte helped provide some of those guns. More importantly, they had gunpowder, and more importantly, he had trained soldiers who knew how to fight it. Now, you know, Clay Williams can't show up and fire you know, a howitzer. I don't know how to do that. So that is probably Lafitte's biggest claim is him providing uh, ammunition for the guns and soldiers who knew how to use them. You know, they're, they're all over the place, depending on where you see, and I'm, I'm kind of scared right off the top of my head to give you the numbers. Uh, I think the British outnumbered the, the American forces for sure, but uh, you can never underestimate the importance of a defensive position. Um, you know, if I'm standing behind, you know, you know, a nice defensive place, I can shoot you a lot easier than you can shoot me. So that was the most important thing. Uh, I have to look up, if, if you give it a minute, I'll look up and look up the numbers. How many, how many British left there and where did they go? As I said, they ended up loading back on their boats and those are the same men who attacked Fort Boyer around Mobile. At that point, they're dismissed and end up going back to England at that point. Once the war is officially over and it's all said and done, they end up heading back. And Lord yes, I should have made a point. Packingham is killed there. Two of his uh, senior generals are killed there. One of the interesting stories is they, as they gathered those wounded and, and more important dead, they would pack them up in rum barrels to ship them back to England, obviously to well preserve the bodies uh, so that's kind of a, and here he is, the, the brother-in-law of the Duke of Wellington, and his fate is to be crammed into a rum barrel and shipped back to England. That's kind of a, that's not the way you want to go, I don't think. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, um, thank you for that excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that um, Andrew Jackson, or General Jackson, um, owned slaves. Yes, he did. And that um, many of the slaves that he owned, he, he, together with the uh, other free black men, he promised them um, equal pay for them to fight. And that, um, of course, some of them died. Uh, but um, he did not honor that promise. And that um, many who, f who had fought and many blacks slaves and free blacks who fought and died were not satisfied with the treatment they got after the promises that he'd made to, uh, to them to fight. And, and after the fighting, he decided the, the, the promises that he made. And I was wondering why he, that, uh, why he did, why he treated them like that. Well, I mean, the answer is probably pretty obvious. You're, you're right. There were some soldiers who were promised, uh, some African American soldiers who were promised more pay and, and more land. And yes, a lot of those promises were not met. Why were they not met? Uh, probably racism is, is probably number one. I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to try to uh, color anything differently. It's just that's unfortunately that's that's what happened through history. Yes, some of the, the Choctaw Indians were probably promised things as well, and they didn't get that as well. That's an unfortunateness of the of the whole thing. Yes, sir. Um, I had an ancestor who was a commander of a Marine contingent uh, during the battle. He was also the first commander of, old, of the Marine contingent on the old Ironsides, Daniel Carmick. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what role the Marines played? And also, where did he get wow. the Marines? From Mobile? Or were they stationed in New Orleans? Or where did they? Well, the force he gathered finally in New Orleans were scattered from all over the place. I mean, as I said, you know, Tennessee, Kentuckians. There were some regular, what I'm going to call regular U.S. soldiers, a couple of, I think the... 3rd and the 44th Regiment of U.S. Soldiers. Where actual some of the Marines came from, I'd have to check on that, sir. I don't know that off the, off the top of my head. Okay, good. That makes me feel better. <laughs> the, the point of y'all's questions are to ask me something I know and make me look a lot more intelligent. So please make sure when you ask me these questions, you know I know the answer. Okay. <laughs> I hope you that you know the I'll, I'll bring you the mic next. I hope you know the answer to this question. Uh -oh. that I understand from reading history and genealogy that a large number of people that fought in the war 
that were not from Mississippi came back here to live. Do you have any idea of the percentage? I don't know the percentage, but you're exactly right. Obviously, as soldiers were, were maneuvered all over the place, and when it was all said and done, there were possibilities of getting land grants and so forth. Again, this is before you know Mississippi becomes a state, and so uh, there are land grant offices here. So can I give you a percentage of how many stayed? No. Uh, I know some did stay in New Orleans. There are legends of soldiers meeting uh, lady folk in the town and getting married down there and so forth, but I can't give you a percentage. I was going to ask about Brian Kilmeade. Yeah, I have read that book recently. He's yeah. the I'm going to say the Fox guy. Um, I'm always dubious of because if you, I think if you read the book, it's him and somebody else. In other words, Kilmeade's putting his name on there because he's more well known. And, and somebody, it's an interesting book. It's got a few errors in it, but I would recommend it. It's a good read. Clay, you and Mr. Bunn were, had access to documents, diaries, records from the, the military commanders. Tell me where some of those things. Oh wow! Um, uh, you know, the internet is, is is very good. There's a lot of great diaries and stuff. Archives and history has quite a few of them. Um, one of the things we put, I felt like I'm plugging my book again, which why not? Um, at the end of our book, we wanted to. Mike and I were never claimed to be the experts of, of the know-it-all of the War of 1812. We wanted to put something together as a starting point. So we, we provide a, a basic narrative, and then we also list some documents at the back that we think are very important. Some of the treaties, some of the letters that Andrew Jackson wrote, all of Jackson's correspondence has been gathered into bound volumes, and so a little bit all over the place, but we also use some great second-hand sources as well. So it's just, you know, using the Internet and jumping, for, you know, jumping from one hoop to another is just kind of how you have to go through it, of course. There's a Mardi Gras group down in Bay St. Louis. They call themselves the crew of the Mystic Seahorse. They claim that their crew comes from a Battle of Pass Christ Channel or, or a Battle of Bay St. Louis as the British were going sailing to Lake Bourne. Yeah, there was a that? there was there was a a minor affair down there as they're beginning to kind of consolidate their control. I didn't you know, I didn't mention it. It's kinda of funny that the War of eighteen twelve and stuff. I always have to make the comparison of the Civil War. If a Yankee and a Confederate shoot at each other, I guarantee there's an historic marker somewhere marking it. <laughs> it has to be a bigger deal for things. The other thing I want to bring up is there was an initial historic marker for the naval battle of Lake Bourne. It was in Bay St. Louis. Hurricane Katrina wiped it out. It's in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere, but I have recently found out they've re-put the marker down there. Uh, but to answer your question, yeah, I believe there were some 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 minor affairs down there as they tried to, you know, you know, gain hold of, of the land down there. That's a good point. Well, they the, uh, battle. Do they? My guess is how many reenactors are. Is, you know, usually when you go to these reenactments, they're like, you know, there's 40 or 50 people there to represent thousands. In that case, it's probably equal to equal numbers down there. <laughs> well, I. No, no comment on that whatsoever. Speaking of history happy hour, it's 5 to 7 tomorrow evening. Don't forget <laughs> to join us for that. We've come to the top of another hour. Thank you all for being here with us. Don't forget the programs that we have upcoming. I hope that we see you back here next week. For now, don't forget we have copies of Clay's book uh, for sale here. Help me thank Clay Williams for this. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.